Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So it's a pleasure to have this distinguished audience. Uh, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to be giving two lectures with this title at uh, Les Zouches in uh, I guess about a week. So I thought I would try it out on you, and uh, these are topics which, uh, you know, again, the string theory landscape, you know, especially, you know, a lot of work uh, mid-2000, uh, uh, definitely still work going on in the uh, co more cosmological side of this. And a lot of, you know, very, I think, uh, you know, intriguing questions that, that uh, you know, should interest this audience about uh, how to, you know, you know what, what we actually want to learn from both string compactification and these more formal and mathematical techniques that we uh, use to uh, study it. So uh, let's see. I, I, the, I, I think uh, the, the main thing, the main things I want to get across here are the relevance of uh, cosmology, the potential relevance of you know early cosmology for even getting particle physics predictions out of string theory someday, and uh, then a kind of a summary of some of this uh, more recent uh, work on uh, early cosmology, measure factor, that sort of thing, and then at least an outline of how that would feed into particle physics. So, so I'll start by writing down a uh, formula. So, well, let me, let me say, so the, the, the goal here is to someday make something that you would justifiably be able to call a top-down prediction from string theory. Okay, so obviously that's far beyond what we can do right now. And uh, why is that? You know, it's probably familiar to people here. You know, in the mid-80s with the discovery of Claude-Biel compactification and the fact that it got so many things right with uh, so few assumptions, there was a lot of uh, optimism. And, uh, Disagree with you. I mean, of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know if <laughs> was there no? Was there not? You're, you're already disagreeing. Or you're about to. Dis you're disagreeing with what I just said. Or you're yeah. about. Okay. So there wasn't a topic. I don't know. What it, you said. The. Uh, <laughs> Open. I mean, of course, this is a this is a, well to some extent. I don't want to I don't want to turn the whole thing into open discussion, but we can certainly right. comment. Well, I, I just want to comment on, on, on yeah. the statement that string theory does not make a prediction. String theory makes a very clear. Now, what do you mean by a prediction? But continue. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. 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 You know, Please. Argument. So, string theory tells you that in order to have a consistent theory of, of uh, quantum gravity, you need a very uh, specific number of degrees of freedom. And that, that's a very... Uh, uh, but, but what's the testable? What's the testable well, consequence? That's our problem. That's not the problem. <laughs> <laughs> by, prediction, by prediction, we mean... <laughs> by, by prediction, we... No, it's a framework. By prediction, we mean something that no, no, somebody I, this, who... This is, this is sociology. This is not... No, it's not. No, it's not. It's, some, it's something that we can give... I think yeah, let's let's not let's not have such open-ended oh. let's not have such open-ended discussion. No. So well, I, so so prediction is something we could have given to the people that I see, and you know, a very clear example: <laughs> you guys will see supersymmetry. If you don't see supersymmetry, we are in trouble. That would have been a very strong I, statement. I, I just, that, I'm not sure, you can call New York Times with your prediction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to. It's. It's. Uh, I mean, I think the intuition that you're expressing is that we we, we really got something, and we should be able to come up with I mean, such predictions. That, but that the uh, theory predict something, or uh, the second question right, is: so Do we have the, the, the technological <laughs> uh, tools? To yeah, exactly. That's what I'm going to talk about. I, I'm, going to I'm going to discuss a path. We, uh, we certainly don't have the tools yet, but what are the tools? What are, what are the, we don't know that. So uh, anyways, OK, so, so, so let's, again, not turn it into a total free-for-all. So <laughs> OK, OK, so, so I think people you know, agree. And, and uh, again, there, was, there are good reasons to say, well, you, you know, you guys now should discover supersymmetry. And uh, string theory, you know, super string theory makes sense. Yeah. Bosonic string theory does not make sense. sense. At some level, there are extremely good arguments that the theory must contain supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. Of course, the general flaw with that argument, which was recognized since the beginning and became increasingly clear with each experiment, is that uh, 
just because there's this naturalness argument that we ought to see superpartners at 10 GeV or 50 GeV or 100 GeV, well, you know, maybe they're up there at 1 TeV you know, or 10 TeV. And uh, as you build bigger accelerators, you always have this out. And uh, so we'd like to make a more quantitative prediction. I think the, especially the you know, developments of about 10 years ago, really lead to stronger reasons not to put such faith in low energy supersymmetry, basically because string theory we now see has these other mechanisms for solving the hierarchy problem, warping, large extra dimensions. They are logically independent of supersymmetry. You know, we may not, you know, you know, again, within the context of people's work right now, they may not seem to work as well. They may seem to contain or lead to predictions which disagree, but it's not something that we can, again, be so confident about. OK, so, so it's, it's, it's a good question to, to think about, although I think could at the, the sort of they could, in principle. Logically, they certainly can. Log logically, yes. Now, whether such a thing can ever come out of string theory, I, I certainly would be skeptical at this point. But again, you know, as, as, you, as you point out, we don't fully know the theoretical picture. So we cannot exclude it. And uh, so, so anyways, obviously the preferred thing would be for our experimental colleagues to you know, discover low energy supersymmetry, or at least hints of it. But here we're going to talk about uh, this, this top-down sort of goal. And uh, so what would we need to someday be able to make what we could call a prediction? And uh, I'll just put up you know, three ingredients, and I'll talk about an analogy, which is useless in detail, but I, think, I find cuts through a lot of the philosophical questions that arise in this discussion. And then we'll, I'll, I'll get into these questions about cosmology. OK, so what, what would you need to make a prediction? You would certainly need to know something about uh, string compactification and uh, leading to uh, models which uh, contain the uh, standard model and very likely other stuff. You know, of course, it might be the other stuff at very high energy, but uh, that's where the prediction is going to come from, the other stuff. You know, if it's at uh, 500 GeV, we're, we're happy. If it's not, well, that's the breaks. And uh, OK, so that, that, that's, that's universally uh, recognized ingredient that, that many people work on. OK, so now I, I would say that a also important ingredient and possibly equally important, and then people do work on this, is same thing, string compactification leading to models which uh, do not contain the standard model, or even do not, you know, do not contain. <laughs> you can make a one, one sentence comment. I think yeah, uh, this, this really yeah. 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 Discussion. Is, is, yeah. is it a workshop or is it no? Not I think as well. you may make a brief comment. I think, I think I would, I would, I let me let me make my case and then you can you can make a more principled objection. We hear what he said. Obviously, this can lead to predictions. The question is, I mean, how sound are those predictions? The comment will be very brief, so don't. don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you can calculate the Ericsson mass, that's a prediction for, from string theory. Yeah, but if you get 0.6. So you don't need the other stuff. If you get 0.6 MeV, does that disprove string theory? Sorry? If, suppose you calculate and you get 0.6. Does that disprove string theory? I wanted to make my comment brief, so. Good. OK. OK. That was my brief reply. <laughs> OK. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so I, w I would say that this is really also important, and in other branches of science, recognized to be important. That uh, you may have a positive hypothesis about your theory, but you have to test it against null hypotheses and negative hypotheses. And uh, so, this is the extreme case where we're asking, you know, you know, what about all these cases where string theory doesn't lead to the things we see. And uh, of course, this might start to lead in a direction, well, you know, maybe this is you know, much likelier than that. OK, we don't even know. What, I didn't say yet what I mean by likely. But uh, just because there's one case that does this, you know, and you know, many more, quote, preferred cases to do this, where are we? Again, you, know, you, you can flip a coin 100 times and get heads every time. And that doesn't disconfirm the hypothesis that it's a 
fair coin, but it certainly should lead you to be suspicious. And that comes from looking at the larger set of possibilities. OK, so, so finally, within you know, you know, all this stuff sits in some idea of how likely the uh, possibilities are. And uh, so this has been considered for quite a while, this question, by a few cosmologists, you know, especially Andre Linde and uh, Alexander Vilenkin. And uh, so to really have a principled discussion, you need some sort of probability measure on the various vacuum configurations of the theory. So again, I don't want to have a lot of preliminary or you know, you know, d definitions of, of points. So we're granting that uh, there's one or many effective potentials for these compactifications, and that any very, very long-lived uh, minimum, metastable local minimum, is a candidate to describe our universe, and then of course you, you calculate the predictions and decide whether it fits the data, you know, what, what predictions it makes. And then the additional ingredient being talked about here is that there's some process in very early cosmology which creates. Okay, so so here's the you know again the theoretical landscape of the potential, and then here's a uh, space-time picture where you may start in a, a particular configuration or with a particular wave function, but what's going to happen, and I'll get into this in somewhat more detail, is that uh, you'll create many different causal regions, you know, with positive cosmological constant regions that are expanding, and they can sit in different vacua. And uh, so we could be sitting in any one of these, and then there has to be some way of interpreting this process that leads us to assign probabilities to the outcomes. And uh, then that's how we're going to use this data to try to decide what's a uh, top-down prediction of the uh, theory. And uh, so then, given those three ingredients, we can write a formula. Okay, so there is what you would properly call the likelihood. Okay, so we'll define some class of models with uh, low energy supersymmetry. Okay, and then that uh, we won't, I'll say, you know, also matching the standard model and uh, the other observables. And I'll write the formula and then. Okay, so, so mu is a probability measure, and now by SM, I'm going to mean the uh, sum of all the vacua that match standard model and whatever other data we feel we've measured and we're going to throw into the game. And uh, that would certainly include the cosmological constant. That would certainly include uh, getting a cosmology that could match observation. So there is the microwave radiation. It looks very much as if it was created by a phase of inflation with a delta rho over rho, 10 to the minus 5. You know, things are not so clear theoretically that you can 100% say that's inflation, but it certainly looks a lot like that. In any case, you need to match that. And uh, you need to match various other observations, such as dark matter. And uh, then within the set of all of these vacua that, that do that, there's some subset that we would want to say have low energy supersymmetry. And again, the operational definition for the next decade is that uh, there are superpartners at the mass ranges that we could produce using LHC. And of course, you know, we're really interested, of course, in you know, LHC, you know, you know, intersect that something. You know, anything we could discover at LHC is interesting, but this is a much more you know, theoretically nice class of models than just, you know, anything we could imagine. And we can hope to say something about it. And, uh, okay, so, so then there are these probabilities that uh, somehow early cosmology has created these things. And then, properly speaking, when you talk about uh, comparing different theories that claim to reproduce... Yeah. Are you assuming that these are the sort of quantum states in some... No, no, they're definitely not quantum. They're no definitely, well, maybe in, at the Planck time when the dynamics was happening, that's possible. But certainly at the present moment, we live in one of these vacua. We see no superpositions within any other vacua. 
you know, they're all just completely independent decoherent outcomes from our point of view, you know, as, as observers of the present death. Yeah, this is a probability measure. Now. And uh, so we're only doing statistics at that point. And uh, so there's this discussion I won't get into that uh, you could put this in the framework of Bayesian statistics. And uh, in any case, if you have a given data set and now you're going to say, well, you know, what is, how much do I believe these different candidate theories that uh, would uh, possibly explain that? data set, then you reinterpret the probabilities. And of course, the, the intuitive thing and the correct thing is that you know, I'm going to most believe the theory that has the largest probability of producing that uh, data set. But uh, you, know, there's, you, can expand, you can expand on that discussion. And I won't do it here, but in the simplest case where we're, everything is, you know, our, our, the, the theories we're, we're comparing are just different vacua of string theory. It, with a given choice of measure factor, it reduces to this ratio, which is clearly between uh, 0 and 1. And uh, if it's 1, then the only way to get the standard model is low energy supersymmetry. And everybody would agree that's a prediction. And uh, conversely, 0 is definite. But uh, the non-trivial claim, which it, it took me quite a while to make my peace with, but uh, I, I did more or less, is that if this came out to be 10 to the minus, uh, if this came out to be 10 to the minus 100, and then we discover low energy supersymmetry, that's a very problematic observation, as would, be, as would be the converse. If this came out to be 1 minus 10 to the minus 100, and we uh, do not discover supersymmetry, that would be very problematic for string theory. Although there would still be vacua that reproduced you know, under you know, the, the, the situation. And we could try to say, yes, string theory predicted whatever it was because it has a vacuum that, has, that matches the data that we see, neglecting the fact that you know, 10 to the 100 more vacua predict the opposite thing. Okay, so, so, so why should you believe this? And this is, again, a, a, a very problematic point because uh, you know, we only live in one universe. And this is exactly this intuition that uh, you know, if, if something comes out of your theory and it matches the data, then that's good. And only if you can't match the data is that bad. And uh, it's, it, it's problematic, you know. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you the analogy, which I sort of like, because it, uh, again, it's, it's, it's much clearer. And I think it, it, it makes the situation sound very bad. And it's actually better for string theory than for this analogy. And uh, so, so what the analogy is is basically suppose you were, you know, an alien you know, even you know, somehow contacting this universe from some other universe. Okay, so it's very limited what you can do. You, know, you build a huge you know, Planck scale accelerator, and it produces some sort of a wormhole that can do very, very limited experiments in you know, one tiny region of our universe. And uh, now, just again, to get a, 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 a problem we can picture, let's suppose, you know, not, you know, you know, you know, again, this is more of a, a story. We, we somehow focus in on the neighborhood of the Earth, and uh, we say we've established the uh, you know, particle physics laws and all the way down to the Schrodinger equation of atomic physics. We know there are nuclei. We know there are electrons. You know, somehow we know the masses of the uh, nuclei. And we can calculate using the Schrodinger equation. And now we're told you know, there is this, this planet, the Earth, and you're allowed to pick a molecule near the uh, surface of the Earth. OK, so what can you say a priori about what molecule you're going to pick? OK, you know, there's this you know, vast, but not ridiculously, you know, 10 to the uh, 45 or something you know, molecules to choose from. And uh, of course, you, know, you would have to give some more precise rule. You know? you know, I mean, maybe it is to say that there's you know, some radius from a well-defined point in the center we're going to pick out of this shell. And uh, so, so what are you going to pick? And you know, of course, it, it's easy to guess. You know, very, very likely thing to pick would be uh, H2O, and uh, <laughs> you know, and then there are some other guys that are pretty high up on the list. You know, there's all sorts of things that you know involve uh, silicon and oxygen and various combinations that are fairly likely. And uh, you know, then there are various, uh, you know, less and less. You know, and then of course you get these 
know, extremely complicated molecules, which uh, you know it is, it is possible to pick and so forth. And uh, you know, so 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 what are you going to guess? And of course, you know, we know, you know, we know about the Earth. You know, we know we're, we're going to guess. You know, certainly one of these top four. You know, maybe this one. And uh, then then you can say, well, now what about the the alien? You know, who has only you know, particle physics, you know, the Schrodinger equation, you know, so it's so everything we consider fundamental and none of the consequences. Okay, so, so, you know, how well can he do in this game? And uh, you think about it and uh, <coughs> he could do a lot, you know, if he knows the basic structure of the universe, cosmology, star formation, planet formation, you know, you can get a certain distance. You know, you can certainly, people do calculate and match the, uh, abundances of nuclei throughout the uh, universe pretty well to where, of course, the, the rarer light nuclei provide sensitive tests of cosmology. And uh, then you can equally well start working out elementary chemistry and so forth. And uh, you would have, I think, pretty good grounds. You know, this alien really ought to be able to make the prediction that, you know, these are these are the likely possibilities. You know, maybe there's another. You know, maybe he could have found a, a Jupiter or something else. You know, of course these are different size. You know, maybe he could have found Venus. But there's a few categories, and here's a likely thing. You know, but but you know, who knows? You know, you might be unlucky. You, know, you, you do your experiments. You know, maybe you get uh, uranium hexafluoride. You know, so that's certainly a <laughs> molecule which has existed on Earth. You know, more of it existed 50 years ago than exists now. People are kind of losing interest in it. But uh, it, it's certainly a possibility, and <laughs> yeah. And uh, so suppose you know they pick this, you know, then what do they conclude? You know, I mean, and, and of course, uh, you know, the I, I think what they conclude at this point is, you know, you know, this is this is crazy. You know, either our theory is totally, you know, going the wrong direction, or you know, a better, you know, let's let's redo the experiment. You know, this is just, this is just a crazy thing to say. <laughs> not impossible. You know, definitely the theory will tell you that, you know, yes, there is, there is such a molecule. Yes, these guys do have a non-zero abundance and so forth. And uh, so it didn't falsify the theory. And presumably their theory is not false. But uh, they got it weird. They, got it, they, you know, they, they were very unlucky. And uh, so you know, standing from where we stand with uh, string theory and trying to make top-down predictions, obviously, you know, this is the analogy. You know, we're, we're sufficiently far away from the data that uh, we have to do this large amount of work. You know, people have done a large amount of work. You know, really thousands of people have thought about this kind of thing at this point. And uh, maybe with a few thousand more man years, we'll be at least in, in this kind of position of uh, saying what are likely possibilities. But of course, it could be that some unlikely possibility comes out of the experiment. But then you know, as a theorist, you really should be bothered, and you really should try to explore every loophole in your theory. Or, and of course, this is the problem. You know, we can't literally redo the experiment, but we would be looking for other, you know, other sources of information at that point. So, so it's, it's, it seems kind of pessimistic from this point of view. And uh, what's of course especially pessimistic is that you know, once you get beyond these kind of elementary questions of, of chemistry. You know, anybody that's studied chemistry in school or looked at textbooks, and especially biochemistry, knows how you know, fiendishly complicated it is. And uh, to the point that they, you know, people do have an issue of chemistry, but it's a very specialized thing. You, know, you need a very big computer. You need like 1% precision you know, to get you know, even anything interesting. And uh, so is that, is that how hard the string theory problem is? And uh, you know, there are some reasons to say no. And I'll tell you now something about cosmology and what is, I think, the biggest uh, simplifying factor that makes this project, you know, again, beyond the present uh, theoretical technology, but not a completely wild and crazy thing to think about. And you know, in a nutshell, it's to say that uh, the system of you know, chemistry, once you get up to this level of molecules, is highly nonlinear because you have all sorts of chemical reactions. You know, the basic chemical reaction is driven by two things bumping into each other and having a certain thermal activation energy to go over some barrier. And uh, so you could imagine deriving all these 
equations for the uh, probabilities of different chemical reactions at a given temperature and given conditions. And then you would, so, you know, d by dt of species n sub i is, uh, you know, alpha j, i, j, n, j, you know, beta i, j, k, n, j, n, k, dot, dot, dot. And, uh, you know, the uh, chemists do write these things down. And they're just, you know, of course, they, they describe all, you know, more or less, you know, anything that could possibly happen in classical <laughs> physics. And so they're, you know, you, you know it's, it's <laughs> you, you have to focus on extremely special cases to, 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 to say anything. And uh, on the other hand, what all of the present <laughs> models of uh, quantum cosmology have in common is that there's a similar equation, which I'll talk about momentarily, but it's linear. Okay, so the uh, intuition is that, uh, you know, again, we start with, uh, you know, some patch, you know, it has lambda greater than zero. It might not even be a minimum, of course, you know, it might be an inflating, slowly rolling reagent. But in any case, it's uh, expanding exponentially to the point where you start creating different causal, disconnected causal regions and perhaps uh, rolling down and tunneling between vacua. But it's all linear. You know, the number of vacua j after a certain amount of time is really linear in the uh, previous vacuum numbers because there's not the possibility of two vacua somehow coming together and deciding, you know, let's, let's get together and, you know, do whatever. And this is not obvious from quantum gravity. In particular, uh, back in around 1990, there was a brief, uh, and I think at other times, a brief uh, fashion for what was called third quantization in the theory of baby universes, which was to say that uh, there could be wormhole configurations a priori in quantum gravity. And there could be some amplitude for a universe to uh, emit or absorb some little, uh, say, you know, S3 topology, small universe. And uh, then the analog of these equations is necessarily nonlinear. And uh, so it's not, yeah. Does that mean there's no time reversal symmetry? Well, only going from that's a deep question. You're right, you're right. So that's a question which appears in all, all the discussions of inflation in early cosmology is that uh, we're very rapidly going to make postulates that uh, violate time reversal symmetry. And uh, nobody has really, I mean, everybody knows that's a problem. And uh, it originates, basically, I would say, in the fact that uh, one's tempted. You know, suppose you have a you know, closed or a definite volume region of space time. The usual intuition would be to say that it has some definite entropy and some definite number of degrees of freedom. And then, of course, from that follow, you know, you know it's the combination of time reversal equations of motion and this conservation of numbers of degrees of freedom that lead to the usual arguments and recurrence times and so forth. But in inflation, of course, the volume grows exponentially. And so the number of degrees of freedom appears to grow exponentially. And uh, so at this, at exactly at the step where we start talking about inflation as a classical process that can start with a given causal region and produce more than one causal region of arbitrary size, we violate at that fundamental level the uh, time reversal invariance. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it's possible that things are, you know, our, our understanding is not right even at that elementary stage. Certainly the things I'm going to say depend on this accepted picture. Yeah. <coughs> so, okay. So, so, so anyways, uh, the good thing, you know, besides the fact that it's, it's it, again, not crazy, you can get out results that uh, fit with uh, cosmology. Uh, this type of picture leads to a linear rate equation or a linear equation governing numbers of different causal regions sitting in different vacua. And uh, so it's actually fairly easy to analyze if you know these coefficients. And in fact, uh, there's some evidence, certainly what's come out of all the studies so far, that there's a very simple solution of this equation. Okay, so, to, so, so that's certainly... Uh, would make the problem drastically simpler than what the, the alien says. 
Okay. So, so okay. So, so let's continue talking about this, and uh, I'm not going to kind of. So, I mean, there's there's kind of a, a, a you know, the real discussion of this and the discussion I'm going to give, which obviously leaves out a lot of interesting and important uh, points. And uh, the present status of this, I mean, I, mean, yeah, I assume people you know, all have looked at the basic theory of inflation. So uh, we can take a single, you know, again, a homogeneous universe where all the dynamics is just the scale factor and the values of the scalar field, which to a you know, zeroth approximation are just assumed constant. And then we get this uh, dynamical system where the basic dynamics is that you roll down the potential. You do a gradient descent. And uh, as long as the energy is positive, then this controls the uh, rate of expansion in all of spaces expanding exponentially. And then at least uh, you know, locally, to the extent that you can neglect this uh, gradient descent, you're in the sitter space. And so that generates uh, horizons. So we could make a uh, causal diagram in the first instance of some constant lambda the sitter space. And again, I think it's probably familiar to people that uh, that uh, if, I, you know, if I draw in some metric way, this would represent the exponential expansion of space. If I make a conformal transformation to represent the uh, causal structure, then I have this uh, time-like future infinity and a light cone starting from you know, any finite time, any given observer, his forward light cone just covers some you know, finite fraction causally, you know, effectively you know, zero measure fraction in metric volume. And uh, so you see manifestly that you're creating disconnected regions and an infinite number of them as you approach this uh, future time-like infinity. So that's the basic process. The basic process is that the number of these causal regions is growing without bound. And uh, then in any given one, if it's not at a you know, critical point, it's just going to fall down into one of these local minima. And uh, then at that point, you need to start making ansatzes about uh, quantum gravity to uh, further describe the situation. And the basic ansatz, which uh, even is not fully explored, but people haven't, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know People haven't even got to the point of, of much discussing how you would go beyond this ansatz. Is that uh, once you're at a local minimum, you continue inflating, and uh, then what can happen is a, a quantum tunneling event. And uh, this tunneling happens by nucleation of a uh, false vacuum within whatever vacuum you have. And uh, then it's much like the uh, discussion in field theory, where you need to uh, gain you know, free energy or action, you know, total, total action, which you can do by uh, compensating. Right? So suppose there's some domain wall tension in 3 plus 1 dimensions that has units of uh, you know, 1 over length cubed. Then uh, you need to compensate the uh, difference of energy. You might gain energy if you're tunneling to a lower energy minimum. You need to gain enough energy to compensate the positive energy of the domain wall. And uh, so that would lead to a tunneling amplitude roughly tension to the fourth over difference of energies. And this is 3 plus 10 dimensions cubed. And uh, so that would be the flat space estimate. And uh, then, of course, it's much more interesting in curved space. And there's a lot that one can say about it. The uh, basic thing that you could say, and this was, again, initiated, as I'm, I'm sure you know, most of you know, by Coleman and DeLuca in the uh, early 80s, is that uh, if you try to tunnel the same way to a sufficiently negative energy vacuum, then uh, although naively you could make the same argument, then, of course, the bubble now has this uh, negative curvature. And in a negatively curved geometry, of course, uh, surface becomes proportional to volume, where size is greater than the uh, 
curvature length. And so eventually you lose the possibility of having the uh, energy gain dominate the uh, positive domain wall energy because the size of the domain wall is also growing with the same, same rate. And so there's some sort of barrier here beyond which you have trouble tunneling. And uh, so, so that's, that's a change. And there's a variety, of course, of other modifications to this formula. But th this is still pretty good for this case of uh, tunneling between uh, the sitter vacuum. So you can do that. And uh, you can also tunnel up. And uh, that is in, you know, that, 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 that's something that, that somewhat, but not completely, obviously, restores this uh, time reversal symmetry. And in the case of this uh, tunneling up, you would get a factor of the relative uh, entropies. And so this is something you compute just, again, semi-classically looking at the instanton. But it has this statistical mechanical explanation that uh, you would get a factor of the entropy difference that you need to uh, tunnel up. And uh, the Sitter entropy is uh, something like uh, this. So it's inversely proportional to the uh, cosmological constant. Is this you know, rough you know, number of degrees of freedom associated with the horizon around the causal region. And uh, so, so this heavily penalizes uh, up tunneling. So you get this uh, factor of e to the minus uh, 24 pi squared over lambda of the uh, initiating vacuum. And especially you know, once you start getting close to lambda equals 0, this is just uh, obviously a, you know, it's just an exponential of an exponential for the uh, realistic case of you know, lambda 10 to the minus you know, 118 in Planck units. And this is why in all of these constructions, starting with uh, KKLT, it's basically guaranteed that once you manage to find this local minimum with lambda slightly positive, almost all of the stability issues are, 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 can, be, can be neglected. Just this fact of prevents almost prevents any kind of the case, certainly over you know, cosmological time scales. OK, and there's still some possibility of these things. OK, so, so that's the uh, next level of the dynamics after we take into account the basic processes of uh, inflation, creating causal regions, rolling down. <laughs> then we would try to take into account these uh, tunneling processes. And uh, then, uh, you know, on this level, there are, there are more questions. Okay, so again, right around you know this question of tunneling into ADS, things are, are kind of uh, mysterious at this point. You know, there may be progress based on the idea of finding a dual. Okay, so the, the, the solution, what you find if you try to look at a solution that tunnels into ADS, is that it immediately crunches. It reaches just as you know, ADS cosmology you know collapses back. You know, so, 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 you know, I mean, the FRW, where you have negative curvature in some region, you know, makes a, makes a crunch eventually. So, so too for these uh, bubbles that try to tunnel into ADS. And uh, it's not terribly clear what you do with them in this discussion. But uh, if you say that uh, whatever they do, they, they crunch, we're going to throw them away, at that point, you get a kind of a well-defined dynamics up to now the following point, which is where most of the debate has taken place, okay, which is that uh, you know, now I, I've told you a sort of you know, approximate qualitative picture of the dynamics involving tunneling between various local minima, inflation, which is creating these causal regions. And now we can summarize this on some diagram you know, where all these processes, tunneling happens, we get a new vacuum, dot, dot, dot. And then at the end of the day, or you know, the end of time, Somehow, you need to take this, this process and extract out some, at least, ratio between numbers or volume of this type of vacuum and numbers or volume of the other type of vacuum so that you can define, use it to define a probability. So in the simplest case, you might say that the, well, OK, let's take a relatively, you know, one that seems to make sense in that picture, the spatial volume fraction occupied by the uh, vacuum VI, in other words, in which the scalars sit in this minimum I, is going to become the mu. And uh, you know, again, on this diagram, you know, volumes become 
infinite. So what we're going to try to do is take a limit. We're going to try to take the finite time and try to take some sort of a limit and see if that limit exists. And typically that limit exists. But the problem is that the limit depends totally, what number you get depends totally on what time coordinate you take it. Okay, so you take some succession of space-like surfaces parameterized by your t, and uh, you will get you will get you will get limits here. But because everything is growing exponentially, you know, even the tiniest change in your prescription, right? I mean, you can't uh, a priori say you have to give some prescription. You know, given such and such a situation, you know, where am I going to draw the time, the space-like uh, surface, and by doing that, you can get more or less any answer you want out of this. Yeah? Uh, the probability of tunneling down instead of up in the potential G and compare them? Yeah, yeah. It satisfies the detailed balance relation, which is like another way to uh, justify <coughs> this. Yeah. Isn't there basic, uh, the basic puzzle <coughs> why you don't start in the lower? I mean, why do you ever start at the higher vacuum, right? I'll, I'll get to that. I'll, I'll get to that. Because I'll, gravity basically tells you that it's extremely suppressed. Uh, the question of the measure. I'll get to that. I, 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 I won't solve all the equations, but I'll tell you the standard answer to that. Yeah. So, OK. So, so anyways, uh, the, I mean, we have to get to this equation before I can you know, tell you the answer. So uh, I, mean, well, I, mean, I mean, well, yeah. I, 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 there's probably an intuitive way of saying it, but let me do it in terms of the equation. OK. OK, so, so, so this is largely what the debate about the measure factor is, is it's either, in general terms, some way of defining this limit, or the way most of the prescriptions work, some way of defining these uh, space-like uh, surfaces, which uh, you know, resolves this ambiguity. And so one popular one is that uh, <coughs> you treat things as locally homogeneous, you know, very rapidly in any given bubble, you become homogeneous. And then you try to use the scale factor there, and you try to match up the scale factors between you know, along this thing, and then you use the scale factor as time, which is always a nice choice. So that's uh, one choice. There's a, a similar thing where you actually use a sort of preferred light cone time along these uh, bubble walls. There's a bunch of, and the point I think where people started to feel they could make progress on this, again, problems which was raised back in the late 70s, a bunch of other prescriptions which superficially look very different, which say, uh, well, you know, this is all, you know, a very, very, you know, intriguing picture. But of course, it's all totally unobservable. You know, you know, certainly we we will never observe. You know, we start out in our universe. We are confined to that causal region. In fact, no observer that we could conceive of could ever observe this whole picture. And the situation is rather analogous to a black hole complementarity, where we have these two possibilities of falling into a black hole. Or remaining outside and watching. And uh, those two observers can never really get together to compare their data. Perhaps we could make more sense of the situation and the paradoxes of black hole evaporation by instead postulating a complementarity, as Tuft and Susskind did, and saying that really the same quantum state has at least two interpretations of the asymptotic observer making one interpretation of the state, watching the black hole evaporate, and then the infalling observer, which is for his you know, whatever time he lives, can at least imagine that you know, his interpretation in terms of falling through the horizon and not feeling any drastic influence on him is an equally valid but totally different interpretation of the quantum wave function. And Ian, that idea has been out there for a while. I, I think it's very hard to decide how much truth it has, but the hope for looking at that sort of thing will be some duality where we're going to exhibit within a common dual gauge theory with a definite idea of wave function, somehow we'll exhibit two maps to these two different interpretations of some local region of bulk geometry. So that's a certainly a viable idea, although not, not yet precise. And now one can try to say the same thing here, or at least the analogous thing, which is to say that uh, here's our causal region. All we can ever see is this causal region. All these other observers may exist according to some interpretation of the wave function, but that's uh, certainly not our interpretation. Our interpretation says that uh, you know, we just see this, you know, and that's it. And uh, of course, 
that you would then say, well, that, that throws away all the, almost all the information. We just saw this. Now, you can try to jump from that and say, well, the real wave function somehow has support over all the different vacua that we could have seen. Right? You know, maybe we could have been in this you know, type B vacuum instead of the type A vacuum. Maybe if I square the wave function's component of type A versus type B, I get a relative probability. Maybe that will match up even, you know, perhaps with these uh, relative volume fractions. And again, it, it, it sounds very appealing. And uh, it would be a nice answer to how these things work. It seems far from what people can do right now. But what you can do is you can say, let's make a prescription of a very different flavor instead of uh, looking, you know, trying to formulate this whole time-like surface and trying to define this limit. Let's instead just focus on the causal region of one observer and uh, say, well, I'm sitting back here. It's still true that I could have you know, observed tunnelings in the future. I could have tried to you know, avoid them and watch, you know, you know, at least you know, detect the fact that there's a tunneling and uh, make a prescription. This becomes well defined if you postulate an observer who's actually had to pass through these bubble walls to pass from a universe A to a universe B. And then you can ask a question like, you know, what's the probability at the end of time that I find myself in a universe A or B? You still have a problem like this because, in principle, you know this, this this continues forever. But you can try to define now a limit, but now a time averaging instead of a space averaging. So we're now going to follow one observer, and we're going to try to look at the relative time he spends in each vacuum. So so it sounds quite different, and there are a number of prescriptions <laughs> like this. And what's been discovered in the last uh, two or three years is that. They generically give same answers as some global description. So there's this principle that is called local global duality. And this is especially work of Raphael Busso, though you know, there are others that uh, would take a, a precise single observer prescription and then show well, that gives the same, pr same probabilities as some other global prescription. Now, it doesn't say that either one is right, but at least there's not as many possibilities as you might have thought. OK, so, so that's the kind of progress, which has been taking place in this field. And uh, out of the something like eight possibilities listed in the recent review by Freivogel, you can show that uh, there are really only maybe four. And uh, then what you typically find in this business is that uh, there's a very good chance that a well-defined prescription will predict evident nonsense. Okay, so of course, that's the virtue of the top-down approach, is that to the extent you can predict anything, very often you predict nonsense and you can throw it away. And uh, so one popular or common flavor of nonsense has to do with what's called the youngness paradox, which says that, uh, again, things are growing exponentially. Even you know, you know, there's all these vacua that are you know, way up you know, you know, at high scale. So even waiting a fraction of a second produces this you know, huge, huge expansion of the number of causal regions. And uh, so any kind of simple prescription tends to have the problem that if you delay, so instead of saying that the universe is 13 billion years old, let's say it's 13 billion years old minus a second. Well, that second gives you time to produce a very huge number of additional universes. And so any kind of simple prescription now will take that factor into account and predict that, no, no, the universe is really supposed to be 13 billion years minus a second old. And then you can see this. This never stops. So such a prescription tends not to make sense. You can anthropically condition. You can say, I'm only going to take the things where we're 10 billion years old, you know, or whatever, you know, four and a half billion. We have that direct evidence from the Earth. But then you want to wind up into the rest of the universe goes into contortions to make you know, us as observers live the minimum time. So that, that, that's obviously false. And you can throw out some prescriptions that way. Another uh, favorite one in this community, although I certainly <laughs> tend to just uh, you know, pass on, you know, pass on pass such papers in silence, is there's this Boltzmann brain paradox that says that uh, you know, there's always the possibility of some bubble, some small bubble of universe coming into existence, which is really just big enough to hold you know, a single conscious brain you know, with all of his observations somehow you know, artificially you know, produced you know, by inputs sent into uh, this single being, incredibly unlikely, but uh, not as unlikely as some other things in this business. And so any, any prescription that 
basically involves lifetime so large that you have to even think about this. It tends to get falsified for that reason. And uh, that leaves at least two prescriptions, but it turns out that uh, both of those prescriptions lead to almost the same equation down here. Okay, so that's this uh, scale factor and light uh, prescription here. And uh, now the kind of equation that you get is a uh, A very simple linear rate equation where this is the tunneling rate in uh, you know, Hubble time per Hubble volume. And uh, there's basically you know, questions about the exact definition of, of this thing now have influenced how the, uh, you know, you have, but based, based on your precise definition and measure factor, you'll, you'll define these rates slightly differently. But the exponential part of the rate remains the same. It's just the prefactor, which now depends on the uh, prescription. And then this is an intuitively very simple thing. It's just saying that uh, you, at any given time, have some set of these causal regions. There's some rate for a vacuum J to tunnel into I. And that gives a plus <coughs> contribution to that number. There's some rate for I to tunnel out to the other J. And that gives the minus contribution. And so that's exactly the flavor of these <laughs> chemical rate equations, except that it's linear. So, okay, so, 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 so once you got up to this point, you know, now you can you know, come back to your measure factor prescription and uh, you know, see that uh, you, know, you are talking about a candidate uh, measure factor <laughs> you, mu, you know, obviously with the condition that it's a probability. Okay, so. So it's not, you know, it, it, indeed, it's, 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 a, it's a, it, in, in many points on very shaky ground. But at least there is this, uh, you know, at least, I don't know, you know, calling two possibilities a family is, uh, <laughs> is really, uh, you know, fair. But in any case, uh, there are different assumptions you can make at this point that lead to more or less the uh, same equation. And then the claim is, that, of course, you take the limit as t goes to infinity of this equation. And then this is a very simple equation. This is what's called a Markov process because it's linear. And uh, if you throw out, just to simplify a bit, everything like the ADS where you tunnel into it and you can't come back. You know, so if there's any Minkowski vacuum over here, they, they change this discussion in an interesting way because now you can try to say, I'm going to be an observer in the Minkowski vacuum. I'm going to try to justify my uh, arguments that way. But from the purpose of this equation, you can just throw all of those out. And you get an equation where you can think of this as like a big matrix on the, uh, acting on the set of uh, a vector indexed by the set of the sitter vacua. And then you just want to find the lowest eigenvalue and the corresponding eigenvector of that matrix. And that's mu. So general results will tell you, you know, there's some lowest eigenvalue. The eigenvector will have positive entries. That's, uh, that's it. Yeah. I mean, this, this is a completely general discussion with just no springy input at all. That's right, right. This is all quantum gravity. And on the other hand, to the extent you're relying on semi-classical quantum gravity, it's, it's not likely that the string theory would change that. Of course, there were many other points, you know, such as what we did to the ADS vacuo, where this might change in some interesting way. OK. OK. So, 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 so let's grant that. And we're not using, we're not relying on very much. What we're relying on is, again, this semi-classical tunneling process. So if that were wrong, then obviously this is all up for grabs. But that's the only thing that we're really asking from Euclidean quantum gravity. And now I can answer your, 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 your question. Okay, so, so basically, again, under extremely weak assumptions about this matrix, the uh, initial state goes away, right? I mean, I just told you the answer was this uh, eigenvector with the lowest eigenvalue. It's true if this is disconnected, you know, if, if you can have uh, you know, block diagonal matrix, lowest eigenvalues up here, you start down there, 
then you could violate that assumption. But it takes that kind of extreme uh, situation you know, to, uh, to violate that. And so from this point of view, you, 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 you do not care what the initial condition is. You do not care how likely it was to produce any given vacuum at the start. It always converges to this attractor distribution. And that was certainly considered a virtue by Linde and Blanken. And uh, to the extent you can get any prediction out of it, you know, it's a virtue. For existence of the aggregate, this is finite dimensional proof. You can have transient states, and if you have infinite dimensions, that's right. And it's, 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 it's important at various stages that there should be finitely many vacua. And without giving a long discussion of that, I've, I've written a number of papers, as, as of other people, arguing that if you put a cutoff on, well, the energies don't go above and below the Planck scale, and the size of the extra dimensions has some upper bound, then there'll be a finite number of vacua, a finite number of these minima. So yeah, that's right. That's an important uh, point. And I'll come back at the end to the, I think, an important loophole in that point, which is that, uh, again, we've just kind of assumed the you know, 4 plus 6 or 4 plus 7 splitting by hand. And putting the bound on the volume is reasonable from the point of view of present day physics. Okay, so so we have we have to come back here and say, well, especially I'm going to look at these. You know, what, what what class of you know configurations do I look at, given that I'm looking at things that have nothing to do with uh, the real world? And uh, it's both you know for a variety of reasons. Okay, so basically this the size of the extra dimensions, the volume of extra dimensions, translates directly into the uh, strength of gravity. As that gets bigger, the effect of gravity in lower dimensions becomes weaker and weaker. The system becomes easier and easier to analyze. And what always happens is that past some maximum size of the extra dimensions, the thing goes unstable and just starts to blow up forever. So we don't. So there won't be. There will not be. There will not be minima out so arbitrarily far. That, that's that's kind of the core of this this argument. And uh, so certainly from the point of view of a mu, which we're going to use to answer these questions, it's very natural to throw those out. But let me remind me to come back to that point at the end because we're going to get some other paradoxical things in a little bit. OK, so let's see. It's 11. Uh, should I? OK.